Welcome everyone to our virtual 2020 PWS Family Conference presented by Levo Therapeutics. Before we begin today's presentation, let's first thank our amazing sponsors, Levo Therapeutics, Seleno Therapeutics, Harmony Biosciences, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, Saniona, and Novo Nordisk. Their support allowed us to make this conference free for all our community members, and we are incredibly grateful for their contributions. In today's session, Optimal Nutrition, Melanie Silverman will discuss what foods you should include in your nutrition plan and what foods to avoid. Melanie Silverman is a registered dietitian and board certified lactation consultant. Melanie is currently the Chief Clinical Officer for Pacify, a telehealth mobile application for new parents. Melanie has worked with children diagnosed with Prader Willi syndrome since 2004 when a very special family approached her to help with their infant son. She knew very little about Prader-Willi syndrome, but decided to learn and support the family as much as she could. Since then, she made it her mission to help as many families as possible navigate the often confusing world of nutrition for Prader-Willi syndrome. Without further ado, I welcome Melanie Silverman. So I just wanted to, um say thank you for having me. Um, I am going to talk to you for a little bit about um, what optimal nutrition and prader willi syndrome would look like. I'm gonna try to leave a lot of time for questions at the end. Um, I've done a couple of these and um, over the years. And so what seems to be the most popular is just to shoot a bunch of questions at me. So um, I'll do my best to answer. Um, and uh, we'll move from here. So let's go over the objectives for today. Um, you know, this, I just want to say this. <laughs> so I actually, I have done these since, I don't even know how, how long um, it, I've been doing this, um, but I've learned a ton from my audiences. And um, what I've learned is, is um, just recently, um, is that I think I need to address your relationship with food and nutrition first. Um, I think we spend so much time thinking about the children, which we absolutely should, but I think before I move forward, I just want you to just take a moment and examine your relationship with nutrition because it is a very personal, complicated relationship <laughs> probably. And so we need to address that because you have to kind of address what's going on with that before you move forward um, and being able to take care of your child. So that's the first thing we'll talk about. The second is we're gonna emphasize diets that offer a good source of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Um, and if you're kind of lost and you're thinking, what is she talking about? I'm going to go over some of this. So some of this is going to be review, especially for those who have PhDs in nutrition. <laughs> but um, I think it's always good to just kind of go back. So we're going to do a little bit of that. And then we're going to talk about how to feed a family and the importance of planning meals and exercise. And hopefully um, you walk away feeling a little bit more uh, supported and educated in what you have to do. Um, here we go. So I just want to take a moment here. I've had, um, you know, I signed up to be a dietitian. I wanted to do this for years and years and years. You did not. Uh, you didn't want to do this. <laughs> this is probably not what you signed up for. And you are being forced to be a nutritionist. Now, um, because you have to, it's part of what your life is now. But what I want to say is, is that really everybody, every parent in the United States should be sitting in on this lecture. Um, everybody, when they have kids, should become a nutritionist. You're trying to figure out, you know, you take care of your kid. You're trying to figure out behaviors in schools and this, that, and the other. But we, gosh, we don't get a lot of information on nutrition. Uh, pediatricians may know something, but they don't have a lot of time to educate you on that. And so I know that you did not choose to do this, but I, I hope to try to change your brain a little bit to think, oh, you know, I've kind of been forced to do this, but really everybody should be doing this. So the information that you have here today is, is, is important, not just for you with your child who's diagnosed, but also um, for, to take care of you, to take care of your family, um, and really everybody should be sitting in here. Um, the first thing, this is actually new to my lecture because I've just seen it so much. I need you to think about, just take a moment and think about what your relationship to food is. Um, this brings up a lot when you have a new baby diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome and you have a history of anorexia or bulimia, orthorexia, 
um, binge eating disorder. Um, and then you have got to figure out what are you going to do with this kid. Um, and so if you are actively, you know, struggling with your food, I really urge you to get help um, so that you can then be able to help, you can help yourself and you can help your family. And so I think taking a look at that is, is really, really important. Uh, food brings up a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And then when you throw a child with Prader-Willi syndrome into the mix, um, it can get really complicated. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because I've heard it so much. So it's not just something that there's a couple people have come up to me. It's been really flying in our faces for the last couple of years. And Dr. Miller and I've talked about this a lot and we're concerned. And so that is why I want to bring this up. Um, and I can actually, if you reach out and need some help, I can try to help you find some local help um, if you're having issues with food yourself. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is nutrition is not black and white. So I'm telling you that I cannot say, okay, you have to have salmon and broccoli and you know brown rice, and then everything was going to be great because it, it, it is not, doesn't work like that. Nutrition is so complicated. And you know, what I think is gonna happen is that, you know, for some people, they're gonna have to follow a certain kind of diet with a certain percentage of carbohydrate, protein, and fat. For another, it may be something else. And we're trying, we're starting to see that in more personalized nutrition. Um, but it, it is, it's not black and white. So some of the things I say here, they may not resonate with you. It may not work for you. Um, I'm just trying to kind of cover as, as much as possible to try to help you to feed yourself and feed your family. But just understand that there's a lot of questions still unanswered about nutrition. The other thing is this is a passion fruit, um, which is one of my favorite uh, fruits. It's amazing. If you haven't had it, you should have it. Try to find it. Um, there isn't a magic food or supplement. So there's nothing that we can say that says, you know, if you take this and you take vitamin C and you take da -da 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 -da, everything's going to be okay. They're, they're, you know, the child will, won't food seek, the child will behave, this, that, and the other. There, there is no magic food or supplement, but what we have set up is uh, something that um, leads to the healthiest lifestyle we can have um, within structure that could potentially help. But I just want you to know that there's nothing out there that's really magical um, that can help. So what is nutrition? Um, so when we're just talking, this is for people that don't know a lot about nutrition. I think the most important thing is to kind of just take a breath and take a look at your kitchen when you're done with me um, today, and then maybe pick up a food label and look. And so there's three components to nutrition that are important to know, and that is protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So whenever you pick up food, um, there is some percentage of protein, fat, and carbohydrate in that food, okay? And all those macronutrients do something different in your body. Um, these macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates contribute to calories or the energy in food. So again, if you don't know that much about nutrition, looking at a food label first and finding these key phrases on there is super helpful um, and it kind of gets your bearings. And then you may hear something, the macronutrients are the protein, fat, and carbohydrates and the micronutrients are the vitamins and the minerals. And so that's kind of where we start. Let's talk about that protein. So when you weigh protein, four calories per gram of protein shows up. And these are some examples of protein that we see, eggs, chicken, cheese, salmon. Everybody always says they get hungry after they listen to me talk because all I do is sit here and show you beautiful slides of food. Um, fat is very concentrated. We find that in oils and in avocado. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And then carbohydrates we see in fruits and vegetables, grains, um, and that also is four calories per gram, just like protein. Fat is nine calories per gram, which is twice as concentrated. And then I know you have all heard this. It's very fun. I'm just sitting here in my office by myself. Usually I've got hundreds of people I'm looking out at and I'm just hoping that you're all hearing and enjoying so far, but good carbs and bad carbs. And so there's these, um, kind of categories um, when you talk about carbohydrates. All of these food items on here have carbohydrates in them. They're considered carbohydrates, but there's certainly ones that are better than others. And so in the good category, the green category, we talk about vegetables and fruits, whole grains, more than three grams of fiber per serving, beans, peas, lentils. And in the bad, everything that we like to eat sometimes, candy, cakes, cookies, juices, muffins, these kind of things are considered bad. Um, People ask a lot, you know, can my kid ever have this? Or I'm never giving my kid a cake, Melanie, again. Uh, that's a harsh statement and probably something that's gonna be a little difficult. And while I have them separated here as good and bad, maybe I should relabel them um, a little bit, but choose more often this side on the left is what my advice is gonna be. So when you're looking at foods, 
um, with carbohydrate, protein, and fat. Foods can be a mixture of all three. So if you look at a can of milk or can, who drinks a can of milk? I'm talking about a carton of milk. Um, you will see carbohydrate, protein, and fat on that milk usually. Um, foods can be a mixture of two, maybe like almonds, for instance, can be fat and protein. And foods can be just kind of one macronutrient could be oil. And that's just important to know because again, it's just nutrition is a little shifty and there's lots of lots of ins and outs to know about, but this will help when you're looking at food labels. So let's look at the food label. Um, this is a lot, um, but it's important to look at uh, the top eight servings per container and what the serving size is. So if you ate the entire thing of whatever this is, it would be eight servings per container times 230. That is a ton of calories, okay? Um, so be careful. You have to look at the serving size and the container, how many containers, uh, servings per container that are in there. But if you can see the calories are very big, you've got your protein or your total fat up there. Can I point? Oh, I guess maybe you can see this total fat here, um, carbohydrate. I really like to look at the dietary fiber. I'm gonna give you a little hint right here. Usually, but not all. Um, and you can see this has quite a bit of sugar in it, but it's a good place to look to kind of land on the fiber and just kind of see. You certainly have to look at the ingredients of what's in the pro what's in the food, but looking at the fiber um, can help to kind of anchor you as to what is going on with this food. Uh, foods with higher fiber are often healthier, but sometimes that can be um, clouded with a large ingredient list that you have to be careful of. And then your protein down here. Um, this down here can get confusing. I think that's just my personal opinion. The percentages are um, based on 2,000 calorie diet. Not everybody eats that, so. Um, but it's just, if you are new to nutrition, looking at that calorie, uh, the nutrition facts on the labels, looking at the fat, protein, and carbohydrate can help. Um, but I will say this, an apple doesn't come with nutrition facts on it because it's fresh. And so the goal is here is to eat as much fresh food as possible, probably with things that don't have nutrition facts on them. <laughs> so, um, so what is optimal nutrition in Prader-Willi syndrome? Well, I'm going to tell you something. This that, that you're looking at right now, if you turn something over in your house and it has all these ingredients on here, you better throw this out. This makes me very nervous. Look at these, these dyes and oh my God, I don't even understand what this is. Pyrophosphate, leavenings, bake, well, baking soda, I know. I better know. Polysorbate 60. This is in food. This is chemical. Um, and so... Uh, please don't buy stuff with this, please. Uh, it's not good. Uh, the other thing I want to say is this, you know, I think it's really important um, to talk to your doctor before starting any kind of um, new diet. Um, you've got to be really careful about um, what you're doing um, you know, we, unfortunately, when I've seen people that sometimes that have come to me over the years, they're doing extreme diets and I've seen kids falling off the growth chart and they're not communicating with their doctors and it's very, very concerning. Um, and so please speak to your doctor before, um, you start anything. So I think the bottom line is, and I think you guys all understand this is a healthy diet has variety. Um, I think it's really important that you, you understand what the variety is. So let me tell you a story about how to, how to illustrate this, because sometimes people miss the point on this. Um, uh, you know, I, so I, I don't go to parties much lately because of this pandemic, but when I used to go on occasion and people ask me what I do, they say, you know, what, what is your job? And I'm, a, you know, I'm a lactation consultant and a dietitian. And in the minute that you say the word dietitian or nutritionist and you're at a party, uh, it becomes a nutrition counseling session. And so what people love to tell me, because I don't even get a chance to say, you know, my sweet spot's kind of under 10 years old, is they love to tell me about their kale smoothie. Melanie, I drink a kale smoothie every day. Every morning I drink this kale smoothie and I put in chia seeds and I put in flax seeds and I put kale and cucumbers and parsley and celery and lemon every single day. And I know in their brains, I know they think this is the healthiest thing in the world and everything is so great because they have their kale smoothie every day, but it is not healthy to have this every single day. And so a varied diet is really, really important. And even if you're eating something that you deem super, super healthy uh, every day, I don't think it's nutritionally sound to eat that way. I think you really need to have a varied diet. I can't uh, you know, express this to all of you enough. Um, 
you know, different things offer different nutrients. And, you know, what you may think is very healthy over time um, may not be. And so I think it's good to limit your exposure to everything and just use moderation. Um, and so what we're seeing a lot of, um, uh, what we're hearing a lot of, you know, there's the kale smoothie people talking to me, but there's also low carbohydrate diets. And um, I think we got to be really, really careful. Um, like I said, and I alluded to this, I mean, you, you can't just manipulate, well, you can do what you want, but I'm advising you, you cannot ma manipulate your, you know, your kid's diet um, to some extreme um, and expect, you know, amazing results all the time. I've seen kids on very low carbohydrate diets or low carbohydrate diets who are falling off the growth charts. Um, and they're not getting the nutrients that they need. They can't stay awake in therapy. And so um, you have to be very, very careful. Um, I think that there, in the past, we we emphasized, you know, it was a problem in the 1990s, I think we were talking about low fat diets and high carbohydrate diets. And even, you know, my governing body, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics was very into low fat. Um, I'm sorry, low fat diets. And so this is not good probably for the general population, um, but going too low in carbohydrates um, can be a problem, especially in the pediatric population. Um, so I have to bring this up um, to talk about it because I think it's worrying some of the people that are working in, in Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, you can go too low and it can be dangerous. And so you need to be aware. And that's why I think a very diet different food groups, good complex carbohydrates can be helpful. Um, one of the things that we've, we've kind of heard over and over again, and I think can nicely translate in part of Willi syndrome is the Mediterranean diet. And so um, if you just go and read about the Mediterranean diet, um, it does talk about red wine. Uh, you can have red wine if you want, please don't give it to your child. Um, but uh, you know, there's some benefits here. Um, it's, it's very much a, a rich source of, of um, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, protein, fat, um, and healthy carbohydrates. So nutrient dense is actually what I'm talking about. This is a beautiful slide of the nutrient density of what we talk about. Fresh foods um, are best. I'm just going to show you a couple slides of pictures that may kind of illustrate this. Um, eggs are a source of protein rice, vegetables. Again, a lot of you probably may already do this and that is great. This is just uh, driving the point home. Everybody loves some salmon and broccoli. Well, maybe not everybody, but it is super healthy for you. Um, don't freak out, but you could add some brown rice, which I think is an important source of carbohydrates to that. And that makes for a lovely meal. Um, in the morning, some, instead of having that kale smoothie, please, if you're having the kale smoothie, can you please have some oatmeal with pecans and a little bit of milk or something. Could try some coconut milk, that would be nice in there. Um, uh, this is a nice breakfast with some protein and carbohydrates, complex because it's oatmeal. Here's a lovely omelet um, with vegetables, some whole grain toast. Um, these are further meal makeovers that you can look at. Like let's say you're eating cereal, milk, and grapes, which it's, you know, kind of carby. Um, oatmeal made with milk, cinnamon, and pecans may kind of even things out a little bit. Um, if you have tuna fish on a bagel with pretzels and apple, you can kind of sl slim down the, that big thick bagel a little bit to put it on wheat bread or tortilla, add some vegetables there. Spaghetti, salad, and garlic bread. There's these awesome recipes online for roast, using roasted eggplant as your lasagna noodles. I encourage you to look. There's tons of recipes on there. You can look at Pinterest. You can look at any of those other sites that have great stuff. Chicken noodle soup with breadsticks and salad. You can try some roasted asparagus, fish, and salad. Tacos um, with hard shells. Maybe you can do a turkey taco salad. Um, pasta and cream sauce. You know what? I have to be honest. I have tried to cook spaghetti squash a hundred times, and I am horrible at it. Now, maybe you are great at it. Uh, keep going if you are. But everybody has told me that the spaghetti squash with tomato sauce and Parmesan cheese is great. I just have had a hard time figuring out how to cook it. I think you have to cook it for a very long time at a low oven. So please go try. There should be squash in your grocery stores, hopefully. Um, plain bagel and cream cheese, um, whole wheat toast with peanut butter, um, and then pancakes, eggs, and bacon, whole wheat waffle, eggs, and yes, bacon. You can give, you can eat some bacon on your own and you can have some with your child can as well. Just make sure that you vary it. You don't give it every day. 
Um, these are some resources for you. People ask me a lot, like, where do you cook from? What do you do? How do you? These are some resources. Um, Cooking Light, Food Network, um, Pinterest is great. Um, if you have a very young baby and you're introducing solid foods um, to the baby, this wholesomebabyfood.com with permission from your pediatrician, please. Um, you can take a look at that to get some help there. Um, and so that is some information on that. I want to move into um, something that's important to mention um, because we were talking about prader willi syndrome. And that is that, you know, let's say you're feeding kind of a low fat diet and you start to move towards this nutrient dense diet, you're going to introduce more fiber. And one of the um, um, kind of symptoms of, of prader willi syndrome um, is gastroparesis. And this is slow stomach emptying. Um, and so symptoms include abdominal distension, bloating, abdominal pain, heartburn, um, vomiting is rare, regurgitation of stomach fluid into the mouth. Um, uh, some of these things you need to be on the lookout for. Um, and uh, again, this is also really important. You know, I, you know, eating too many fruits and vegetables, just, you know, just slathering fruits and vegetables all over your, all over your plates for weeks on end is not healthy for uh, somebody could diagnose with prader willi syndrome or anybody. And so that's why the rotation of the diet, getting protein, carbohydrate, and fat into the diet is really, really important because of this risk of gastroparesis. And so chewing food well, hydration, which we'll talk about later, I know can be a challenge. A varied diet, which I just talked about, exercise is important, monitoring stool output. I just think it's important for everybody to know this because we're talking about nutrition, we're talking about what people will eat, children will eat. Um, so please be aware of this and be on the lookout for it, but also really try to, um, give as varied diet as possible and any changes with your, uh, diet should be discussed with your medical team. All right. I, I really am excited to see the results on this one. Here we go. How do you feel about cooking food for yourself or your family? Poll number three. How do you feel about cooking food for yourself or family? I love it and I have little problem preparing and cooking for myself and my family. It's a pain sometimes, but I do it because I have to, or I dislike cooking and thinking about food for my family, which I know people are like that. It's okay. You don't have to become a gourmet cook. How do you, look at this. Oh, 50% of people like have little problem preparing and cooking for myself and my family. Well, that's great. It's a pain sometimes, but I do it because I have to. That's where I am, believe it or not. I dislike cooking and thinking about food for my family. 10% of you sitting out there right now feel like that. I, I feel for you. Do you know, uh, a lot of people have said, uh, could you move in, Melanie, and just cook for us? <laughs> Help us plan these menus. All right, so this is where we are. Um, all right, so let me, let me tell you something. Let's say you're that 10% that like, I really cannot stand this, this drives me crazy. I think you need to, you need to surrender, first of all, um, and, and try to get your head around um, uh, that this, this will be helpful for you and for your family um, to do this. So the first thing I do when I work with clients is I say, make a list of your weekly meals. So just sit there with a blank piece of paper or you can sit there with your computer and just kind of decide, what am I going to you know, um, serve Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. If you want to get really fancy, you can think about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Usually what I do when families are just trying to get themselves together, we start with dinner. Okay. So you just make seven dinners or you think about seven dinners. You make your list of weekly meals and then you look inside, what do I have? So you don't buy double because you know how many people buy, like they already had a can of tomatoes and they buy another two cans. So you got to look around your house. Um, and then you make your shopping list. And then you make your shopping trip. I have found that if you're trying to plan and figure this all out, you've got to devote, you better put that in your Google calendar or your iCal or whatever you're using, that you just sit down on the weekend or sometime during the week. I have some clients that do it on Thursdays and they plan for the whole next week that you sit down for, maybe it will take you 30 minutes, 45 minutes to just sit down and see what you have, what you wanna do, and then get yourself together. I cannot tell you how helpful this is, um, especially if you're working um, to have it just in place um, to make your life a little bit easier. Um, so try that with meal planning and then how to feed. I think this is the most important thing I've done in my whole career, um, more than anything I've told people to um, eat or whatever, um, is how to feed, okay? And this is also really important if you do have um, 
um, a history of any kind of eating issue, um, this really lands um, for everybody. And so the first is I want you all as, as much as possible to eat together. I know this is difficult. Maybe it's been kind of easier, though not that enjoyable <laughs> since the pandemic hit. But please, there's a lot of reasons why I want you to eat together. I think it's community, it's family, it's language development, it's teaching a child to put their napkin in their lap. It's all these types of things that are really, really crucial. Um, so eating together as much as possible is really, really important. Um, set limits and structure and follow through. So sometimes what I do is I actually have people post the rules of how we don't throw food, we don't scream, we don't cry, we don't, you know, something like that. So behavior wise, it's really good to set the limits and structure on um, food uh, and meals. Eat uh, similar foods. So I don't want you to be having this kale smoothie with a shot of something on the side and then your child's eating, you know, chicken and corn, or I don't know. Uh, I really want everybody to eat the same thing. That sends a signal. Um, and it also makes everybody feel included. If there's food allergies or different things going on, that's, you know, a different situation. Um, but trying to eat similar foods is important. No technology while eating, please put the phone down, please. Um, Locking cabinets and refrigerators to prevent access is also something that is a very personal thing, but I cannot tell you how many families have come to me so happy they did it. They were worried about it, but they did it and they felt um, relieved. Um, so that is how to feed. I want to uh, move into common questions. I am paying attention to the time, Melissa, so I see and I want to make sure that there's adequate time for questions. Um, and so I'm just going to flash a couple things up here that most often people ask me about. And that is one is artificial sweeteners. Um, I'm not a fan of these. I'm not a fan of these for the general public um, because, and some people can't tolerate them. So I've seen sugar cravings, diarrhea with sugar, alcohols and headaches. Um, you know, there's some people that can tolerate these that don't have the diagnosis. I just think that it's, um, we haven't seen such great, um, I haven't ever heard anybody say, oh, this works out great. Um, uh, my kid tolerates this, I tolerate it, it it's been fine. Um, we really want you to kind of go more natural in terms of um, um, sweeteners. And so what they're usually using the artificial sweeteners for is hydration, for water. And so there's all these amazing, beautifully marketed waters that have zero calories, but may have um, artificial sweeteners in them. And so I'd like to just suggest gently that, um, Maybe you try some other things to make your water more interesting at home and using actual things that may have a, a, a zip of nutrients in them to help. And the other thing is, is that I learned long ago from a family that I love very much. Um, what they did with their family is that they negotiate their terms. Hydration is also often difficult to get the kids to drink water. And so what they did and what worked and what other families I've heard use is that, and again, it's family to family. I, I don't want to say that this is always true, but they would negotiate their terms. So you have to drink this glass of water before we give you your plate of food. And that worked um, well um, for them and some other families. Um, this is the most important slide that I also put up is probably about exercise. People call and say, I, the kid, he's gaining a bunch of weight. And I say, are there, is he exercising? Not really, Melanie, that's a problem. <laughs> so um, I, I can't tell you how important this is. Um, moving, I know it's difficult. I, mo I know that there's challenges with that, but moving um, helps burn calories. Uh, and, and so it's really, really important. And so finding a way to move as much as possible is gonna help to prevent uh, excessive weight gain. All right, so here, here, here's the situation. So you're listening to all this, you're like, okay, well, I, I kind of, I guess I get it. Um, but what happens when your child gains too much weight? That is what is scary, right? That's what everybody's scared of. You've watched scary YouTube videos and you've sat in Facebook groups that make you cry or feel like very, very nervous. Um, but I wanna break down for you what happens if your child gains weight and I want you to feel uh, empowered that you will be able to um, help your child with your medical team. First thing is please stay calm. So um, uh, people have called me in tears. Mom, oh my God, my, my kid is gaining weight. I can't take this, this is horrible. We have to slash 500 calories. And what I say is well, let's calm down. Uh, sometimes it's just like, could you just exercise one more time a day? Could the child just move around? You know, Can you just go take out an extra walk for 30 minutes once or twice a week? And that takes care of it. So it's something you don't need to go crazy and just slash all the food and, you know, be really, really um, 
strict about what happens. Um, the first thing is, you know, go to your pediatrician, track the weight closely, um, talk to your pediatrician, really have an understanding of what's going on. And I wanted to pull up growth charts for you to see. Okay, I'm hoping you can see this arrow. I think you can. So if we look at this 18 month old, what usually happens when um, people come is that they'll see this jump, right? These are the growth charts. So here's the weight, and this is in, all in your pediatrician's office, and this is the length. And what usually happens is you watch your baby grow, 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 grow. Oh God, what happened here? And you get very, very nervous and you think, oh my God, something is really, really wrong. Um, and uh, I need to slash 500 calories for my child. And it usually is not like that. It's usually something small, like I said, like an extra walk, or maybe if you're feeding whole milk, maybe we look and say, you know what? Why don't we try to go down to 2%? This is the way I operate, okay? This is the way I operate. I hope other dietitians who are caring for you across the country and wherever else everybody is from operate like this too. Um, but it's it just small, small changes can, can make some really big res results and also make families feel like they have control of it a little bit more. So you don't need to slash hundreds of calories from your child's diet. And again, exercise is crucial if you're trying to address this. Um, I, <laughs> oh, I hate calories. Calorie tracking is really cumbersome and really complicated and really annoying. And I've had people come in um, with um, sheet, you know, like printed out versions that look like a book of their calorie tracking for years and years and years. And I really, please, please do not track calories all the time. If you need to do it for a little bit, go for it. But I want you to have the intention of getting off of the calorie tracking. You, over time, pay really close attention to what you're giving in terms of food and, and just try to learn it so that you don't have to calorie track. It is one more thing in your day that is just gonna be a lot. So if you need to lean on something, because people have asked me for this before, that's why this is showing up. Um, lean on these apps for a little bit of help, but then please quickly remove yourself. Um, and again, all people are different. All people can tolerate different things, but I have seen that this causes more problems for people than it solves. Look at this one. It's emphasizing again what I just said. Watch the calories for a little bit and then get off. So this is good. We're going to have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, optimal nutrition and product release to wrap this up. Um, what we want is a nutrient-dense diet with variety. Um, I want you to structure your meals and your snack times and eat together at the table as much as possible. Um, uh, again, that is sometimes easier said than done. I recognize people work, they have night shifts, day shifts, people are kind of all over the place. Sometimes people say, Melanie, the only time that we can have to get together meals is Sunday. That's great. That's great. Just do what you can as much as you can. Um, no television or other devices while eating. Um, you know, letting their child eat in front of the screens or run around while they eat or any of that, that is not the way I want people to feed their children. They need to sit at the table, pay attention to their food, eat, and then go about their business. Locking cabinets and refrigerators to keep children and adults safe. Um, again, I've had a lot of um, positive um, experiences with families who have talked about that. Um, it is daunting and scary to think about, but it also is, is a, a relief. Um, intensive, frequent physical activity as much as possible. I've had children in wheelchairs before. We've done weightlifting before, um, moving our arms as much as possible. Um, those kinds of things are, are very, very helpful. Um, really talk to your pediatrician, okay? A lot of these pediatricians do not understand exactly what prader willi syndrome is, but I will tell you this, a really good pediatrician is going to want to support you and find out and direct you and care for you. And if you have a pediatrician that doesn't, you should fire that person and find somebody else that you like. And so going in for weight checks, you know, every couple weeks is okay. Look at the growth chart, ask for a copy just so you can have it um, and monitor closely. It is normal for children to fluctuate on the growth charts. So much of what I do is I say to families, no, that's actually typical behavior. Like that's actually normal. That is not prader willi <laughs> syndrome. That's just, sometimes they move from percentile to percentile. And so just understand that there's variability. And I know that because there's that variability, it makes you nervous to think, oh my gosh, this is prader willi syndrome. Um, but do understand that some of this is um, just normal fluctuations. 
Um, watching for close signs of any gastroparesis is important. We went over that slide. And then please be thoughtful about your diets. Please understand what I say about variety. Speak to your doctors about all diet changes is really, really important. And, um, you know, learn as much as you can about PWS. I do wanna, I, I have to tell you something. I put this slide in here, Melissa, <laughs> because I have, I remember when FPWR just kind of started years ago and I, I land on that site and I almost burst into tears with joy because there's a lot there. There's research studies for you to be a part of. And I just have to, you know, I know there's a lot going on, but it's just so important the work that they're doing. And I am just constantly impressed with it. And I just want, I'm so glad that people are plugged in and you can find each other and you can help each other. And so I just wanted to just um, say thank you to FPWR for asking me to speak today and also for everything that they're doing for families with PWS. So I wanna thank you. Um, this is the conclusion. This has been about 45 minutes. And so I have, a, I think 15 minutes to answer questions. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I am, let's see, our first question comes from a family with an 11 month old. They okay. said that they have a great relationship with food, but do you recommend avo avoiding high sugar, fat, calorie foods, or is there an argument for introducing a little of everything so those food groups are not sought after? Well, that's such a good question. So every family does it differently, okay? Everybody has their different theories about things. I think the vast majority of time you should feed as healthy of a diet as possible. But I, I, I have to say, and some people may disagree, I think there's room for um, some treats here and there. Um, people ask me a lot about Halloween. They ask me about Christmas and Easter and Hanukkah and all this stuff. And I I like to say in moderation, I think that that's fine once in a while. I think it just depends. I think people want to figure out how people's how a relationship with food is going to be. And um, I don't think we always, um, you always, can, you cannot predict it, even if you, if you have part of a relationship number, you don't. And so I am more of a how, um, you know, not saying no completely, because I think that that can really backfire. I think in moderation, I think they can be used. Hey, Melissa, am I supposed to be on video like this or no? Yes. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to make sure. <laughs> so I hope that answers it. 11 month old. I'm glad. Thank you for starting out with uh, your relationship with food is good. That's great. That's good to, for me to know. So some people um, were asking about high um, sweet fruits and bananas, stuff like that. Like, are those appropriate over, well, I guess, more sugary fruits and, ban and bananas? Well, bananas, everybody likes to talk about bananas, but I think they should talk to Dr. Miller about the bananas. Um, you know, very, again, uh, uh, that is something that um, uh, I, th I think originated with Dr. Miller about when bananas become very sugary over time, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, but they become very sugary over time, they raise your, your sugar levels and it's concerning. And so there were people eating lots of bananas because people don't seem to understand the importance of varied nutrition. And so I think that, um, you know, eating a wide variety of different fruits can work. Bananas, um, you know, if again, I think people get afraid if I have a banana or I give my kid a banana, it's all over. And that is not the case. Um, but I think you have to be very careful with feeding them all the time, very sugary, ripe bananas that have a lot of um, sugar in them. And, um, you know, uh, I think that you can have all, all different kinds of fruits. I see a lot of people feeding only berries, and I don't think that's a good idea. I just don't. I see people feeding tons of berries, blackberries, raspberries. They're doing that because they're lower in sugar, but it's a certain kind of fruit. And there's other things that can offer good nutrition. From Dr. Miller, I've just flat out hate bananas personally. She, I see that she just wrote that. And so I get that. <laughs> but anyways, I hope that helps. A wide variety of foods. We don't want you eating bananas all the time. They can become very, very sugary over time when they ripen. And so that's how I'd answer it. Great. Thank you. Um, next question is, my daughter with PWS loves to have the same breakfast, snack, and lunch every day, but supper is varied. Is that enough variety? I'm one of the 10% that dislikes food prep. <laughs> right. 
So that's probably easy, right? You have it all figured out. Breakfast, snack, lunch is all figured out. That's kind of a tough one. I think over time, I love that dinner is varied. So I'm going to celebrate that. I'm going to celebrate that dinner is varied. So that is great. Um, you know, over time, sometimes kids get into this kind of like their, their habits, whether they have PWS or not, I want to say that that is normal. And so sometimes they may like having that for a while. I would just, I would like you to think, to entertain the thought of maybe varying it over time. Um, I don't want to get anybody upset, but I'm also a dietitian, so I like to have people vary their diets. So I like where this is going. I like that dinner is um, varied, but start to think about maybe trying some different things over time. Don't rush it, because I know it could be um, challenging. Um, next question. Any tips specifically for toddlers? Mine throws veggies on the ground, screams for fruit. My child in particular is underweight, so it's hard to say no to the things she will eat. Also, snack recommendations kind of in that realm. Okay, I need you to repeat this for me, Melissa, please, because yes. a little bit you broke up, okay? Oh, sorry. Um, so, toddler question. Um, the toddler throws veggies on the ground and screams for fruit her child is underweight, so it's hard for her to say no to the things that she will eat. Um, and in that realm, she was also asking for, I guess, maybe a snack recommendations within those, that criteria. Okay, so, you know, behavior is tough. Um, it's, it's a really tough thing, and I think, you know, you have to be, and again, this is like, this, what you're describing is what toddlers do whether they're diagnosed with prader willi syndrome or not. And so it is a behavioral issue. And so a toddler is young, but I've even, I've had people, even when they can't read, I've had people list the rules around the table. We don't throw food, period. We don't throw food. You know, the meal ends if you throw food. Um, the other thing is sometimes if you have the food out, like if, I've seen kids, if they see the apple out or whatever it is, and the mom's like, well, we're not doing apples tonight. Or dad's like, we're not doing apples tonight, but the apple's sitting right there. So be a, kind of watch what your environment looks like. Um, but throwing food and throwing tantrums, the meal needs to end if it's over. And then over time, the toddler will learn, oh, these people mean business. They're not going to let me have food if um, I throw it. So you need to say no, and you can do three strikes and you're out. There's a great behavioral book that's kind of a, it's kind of old, but I love it. It's called One, Two, Three Magic. It's by a doctor named Dr. Phelan, P-H-E-L-A-N. And it just talks about how to discipline your child. And so um, that's one thing. And then the snack recommendations, um, uh, there's really good, if you look into like Mediterranean snack recommendations online, what would those be? Um, that may help you a little bit with that. I hope that helps. Got to get the behavior under control. And sometimes, again, I know it's funny to think about putting up a sign of like, we don't throw food. We don't, I don't know, scream at our parents. We, but pointing to that and saying, see the rule? This is what we do. Even when they're very, very young, from a very young age, I have people doing that so that these children know you mean business at mealtime. But you should end the, let me say this. Now I'm like, really think about this. Don't let children treat you like that. <laughs> like you, when they're young like that, you have to try to control it early so that um, it will help in the future. Um, but I know it's hard. I do. What's next? Next. So I have a couple of families kind of asking the same thing. Uh, five, six month old babies um, wanting to know, um, you know, what should we start with? We have other kids. Do we do the same process we did for our other kids? Yeah. First thing you need to do is talk to your pediatrician about starting solid foods. That's the very first thing. Like I'm not, you know, you, there's a lot of things that have to be in place before a baby's able to start solid foods. That's the first thing. And then we really, it's, it's opened up in the field since the nineties. We used to kind of wait and don't give your kid peanut butter until they're three because of allergies. Now things are a little bit looser. And you can move a little quicker, but I encourage you to go talk to your pediatrician about starting solid foods. Some people start with avocados. Some people start with cooked ground lamb, which is a protein source. Make sure it's cooked. Um, and it kind of sounds like what, we're starting with meat. They used to start with, you know, rice cereal or oatmeal. And it's kind of been changing and people are moving quicker in their introduction of solid foods. Um, but it's exciting when you start to introduce foods. It's lovely and exciting and fun. And so that wholesomebabyfood.com website is also very good. 
um, as you're introducing the foods. So I hope that's helpful. Yes. Um, and I will um, also vouch, we used wholesome baby food when uh, Kemet was a baby and it was oh, yeah. it's such a helpful website. It's so yeah, cool. I'm glad you, you added that. That's great. Um, so there's been a couple of questions too about, um, you know, we have siblings with our child with PWS. How do we do things like um, with birthdays and holidays when there may be cake involved? Yeah. So again, that is, it's, it's, it's really complicated. I, I, I know it's very complicated. Some of the things, and every family does it differently. So again, I am not opposed to birthday cake. This is a special treat. You have to look to make sure that before the birthday cake and after the birthday cake that you really have those nutrient dense diets, that there's you know movement and exercise involved for your child, but having your child have a piece of cake, in my opinion, some people disagree with me, is not the end of the world and is okay. It's part of being a human. It's part of you know enjoying things. Um, and so really kind of making sure that you, um, you do that. In regards to older kids, um, you're gonna have to explain to them what's going on, right? These siblings are some of the most special humans on the planet. And so they're gonna know, you're gonna have to explain. And sometimes what people have done here and there, and again, it's very personal, but maybe you take that older child out who doesn't have PWS for a treat here and there, just on their own, um, you know, not making it a kind of a big deal. Um, you know, we deal with this with food allergy patients, right? So there's certain kids that, you know, can't have peanuts, milk, and wheat, but the other kid can. And so trying, and this is where meal planning is really important, trying as hard as possible to incorporate everybody's eating as much as possible. It's not going to be perfect all the time. Some nights it may be different, but I kind of, I'm kind of all over the place with that answer, but I think I, I think I answered it as to what you can do. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a question. Um, so I have a 16 month old. I'm still breastfeeding. When is it a good time to stop? I'm willing to go as long as I have to. Is there evidence that breast milk makes a difference with child, uh, a child with prior release syndrome? That's a great question. I actually, I do not, I should know, but I don't even know if there's been, maybe there, I don't know if there's been studies on, you know, the longer that you breastfeed certain outcomes. I think that's, you know, kind of hard to study, but I think I'm a lactation consultant too. So I'm, that's great. And I, I think that you have to make the decision how long you want to breastfeed. How long is it going to work for you? You know, if it's, um, if you can handle it for longer, great. If, if it's starting to change and, and your life is such that it's becoming more difficult, then think about weaning. I think it's really your choice. The most important thing for a 16 month old is I hope that food has been introduced and meals are introduced and that breast milk is not the central nutritional source because it shouldn't at all. Um, usually people, when they breastfeed, they breastfeed, you know, into toddlerhood because they're breastfeeding one time a day. So it's really your choice. I think it's great that you've done it and just, you, you have to be the driver on, on that. Um, and so the more breast milk that you provide, you know, it, it does provide some health benefits, even at this age. Um, so I have a question from an, um, an older family. They have a 14 year old, um, when he was younger, um, they were in a different day than we are today. So he's very set in the way he eats and it's hard to introduce healthier foods. So do you have any suggestions or strategies for getting those healthier foods into his diet? Yeah, that, that's tough um, because at 14, um, you know, they, they like what they like and, and know what they know. And so I think, you know, um, in terms of feeding food, you know, your job is to provide the food. The child decides whether they eat it or not. This is called the division of responsibility developed by Ellen Satter. Um, and so I would go slow <laughs> because that's what we know is most important. So you don't just throw salmon, broccoli, and sweet potato on a, on a plate and hope for the best for the 14 year old. I think you go really slowly. Um, I think setting up rules, and maybe it depends on the family because some people don't like this, but put it, posting up menus just depends um, is important. And maybe kind of structuring, you know, <clears throat> we know you like chicken, rice, and broccoli, but we're gonna we're gonna do chicken, rice, and asparagus, which is green and kind of similar. And you know, we don't want you to yell. We don't, you know, the rules regarding that, and just kind of going slow. It's almost like food chaining what they do in occupational therapists when they're trying to get very, very, very picky eaters to start to eat other things. It's called food chaining, where you kind of look at what they like and then go from there. So if you're eating white rice, 
you maybe mix white rice with brown rice and then slowly wean on to brown rice. And so hopefully that helps a little bit. I think we have time for um, probably one more yeah. um, question. Okay. Um, so I, there are a lot of questions and you've kind of addressed this in your, your thing. Um, but people have like elementary school age children and they're just trying to figure out how much food should be in a serving. Mm -hmm. And I know that varies probably per child, um, but we had a lot of questions about that and what fats are good fats to add to that meal. Okay, so like avocados, oils, nuts, um, you know, fish, salmon, those kinds of things, those are really good fats. Let me answer that first. Um, let, me, let me tell you something that I challenge everybody to think about. Um, and that is, um, take a look at where your child is now. Sometimes like, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Like you may be doing just fine and you think you ought to be doing something, but you're already doing okay. And so I think that that is a concern for a lot of people like, well, how much fruit and how much vegetables and how much, I mean, it's a good idea to like try to have the groups that I talk about, you know, protein, carbohydrate and fat at each meal, try to do that and snack, you know, try to have two different components um, and vary it and you know kind of watch the child's weight so you know you can start there's serving there even wholesome baby choice may have serving spots i know or serving um servings the american academy of uh, pediatrics something just thinking off the top of my head like, i think it's like healthychildren.org they may have just general guidelines for serving sizes that you can look at for fruits and vegetables and grains and that kind of stuff. So there's definitely stuff. I look at the AAP, I'd look at those kinds of things to, to see where your serving sizes are. But again, kind of like seeing where the child is plugging into the growth charts. It's kind of a, for some people, it, it feels like you're kind of spinning because you're like, I need to give a half a cup of fruit. You got to tell me, Melanie, what do I need to do? Um, but I, I want you to kind of take a look at where you are and then go from there. But again, the most important thing is, is to really vary the diet um, as much as possible, set up the structure so that your child has this environment that um, can support good nutrition. Thank you so much, Melanie. We really appreciate um, having you. It's always a pleasure to hear you talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I hope that everyone, uh, we answered as many questions. There were a lot of questions, but you know, I tried to combine some. So I think we got through a lot of what people were. So again, I would like to thank Melanie for joining us today. Um, FPWR relies on the generous support of our PWS community to accelerate PWS research and our search for treatments and a cure for PWS. Over the past several years, FPWR has made many advances in research that are leading to new treatments for PWS but we have much work to do yet. Please consider making a personal contribution to FPWR this year to help support the development of new treatments for our loved ones. Thank you again to Melanie and to everyone for attending. Hope to see you later today.